Hello, and welcome to the podcast where we ask our guests, what's your deal? We're showcasing experienced leaders in the deals marketplace, including investors, bankers, brokers, advisors, and entrepreneurs who are driving innovation and building exponential commercial value. We will also discuss adoption of transformative tech, like AI, as it relates to valuation. We're here to learn how it's done by learning from those at the heart of the deals world. Let's dive in. Hi, everybody. This is Mark Corona, and uh, I'm the Chief Development Officer for Authentic. And this is a podcast we call What's Your Deal? Um, It's a new series that we're uh, uh, prototyping. The idea here is that for deal makers, and particularly deal makers who are involved in tech companies or uh, companies that use technology for differentiation, we think that there's a lot of things going on that are worth additional discovery. And my guest today is Stephen Horowitz. And Stephen is a founder and managing partner from a business consultancy called Orchid Black. And Stephen, I'm going to give you, let you have the floor here to introduce yourself and provide a little perspective on kind of your what you bring into this conversation and what you think you'd like to contribute, and then a little bit on on Orchid Black to help our our listeners understand more about what you're up to. Sure, Mark. Thanks. Nice to be here on your inaugural uh, launch of this podcast. So uh, I'm with Orchid Black. We're a boutique consultancy comprised of very experienced operators who've been in the tech and tech-enabled services sector for 20, 30, 40 years. And having experienced startup world, growth world, up to billion dollar plus sort of PE backed and publicly traded tech companies, we've decided to focus on founders Mm -hmm. on their journey who are looking to radically look at the value creation opportunities on the path towards some monetization events. And we've got a unique approach on how we partner with those founders. And ultimately our goal is to roll up our sleeves and not just tell you what you should do, but actually help you go do it and go execute it and go drive the right outcomes. We also focus a portion of our business on supporting the private equity community. And that's both on buy side due diligence and we're not your typical due diligence financial Dig in. We're more on the go-to-market, product market fit. What are those growth opportunities really around the product or service? And then ultimately, in some cases, we come in and help optimize their portfolio along with the same outcomes. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things you and I and our, our businesses have in common is that we look at the go-to-market model, the go-to-market part of any organization's business as a as a, an opportunity, right? And it's a lot of what we involved in, get involved in with Authentic is similar to you. It's, someone's got a growth need, a growth challenge, and that can come from any number of different sources, right? It can yeah. be just a desire to, uh, to d- double in size in three years or five years, or it can come bec- from a uh, uh, position of flat growth or no growth or stagnation. And then, then there's there, there are those companies sometimes that get involved with their slip sliding away because they don't actually have an effective go-to-market model. I think this is an important topic for you and I to take up because focusing on growth in particular, and I use growth, but I should also say that the, the word profitable should be in front of the word growth every time I use it. I probably yes. would agree with that too. Yes. Because it's not growth for growth's sake. We're a couple of guys been around a while enough to know that's not a formula for success, right? Yeah. And we've got often have to remind folks that to grow, you typically have to invest, which means you've got to put the money in and you've got to be really capital efficient. And it's critically important to um, uh, not do science projects because science projects don't always work out well unless you've got a massive balance sheet. And right. most of us don't. Right. Yeah. And there's an old axiom I heard from someone, which I think is, is I carried with me, which is the time to grow is when you can, not when you have to. Right. 
because then you can be more thoughtful, more planful. You've got capital that you can invest in it. You can probably manage the risks more proactively. When you're when the gun is next to your head and you realize I got I've got growth issues now, not opportunities, but real issues. That's a whole different environment to try to grow in. Absolutely. And along that same notion, Mark, the time to raise capital is not when you desperately need the capital. It's when you don't need the capital. Right. And I've always, for the past 20 years, I I like the theory of being bought, not sold. And not that bringing in a banker and running through a process is not the right thing to do. In some instances, it certainly is. But organically, if you've got people knocking on your door because you're doing a good job in the market and your name is out there and you're winning deals and growing, that's always a much better position of strength from which to work from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would totally agree with you on that. And we not only encourage our clients to think about growth in a healthy way, but we also, I think both our organizations help provide them with tools and approaches that are pretty much time tested and based on a lot of expert input to to help them do that and do it in a way that's efficient and effective and will yield a kind of incremental growth that will result in higher valuation. I think maybe it doesn't need to be said, Stephen, but I think we should say this is that you and I think you and I are both very firm believers that if you take a five-year view of any organization, it's incremental profitable revenue streams that drive valuation. I think you can't shrink your way to greatness. It's not, there's nothing wrong with being operationally efficient and an operationally effective, but at some point, and you're smiling, but I know you, you're, you got thoughts on this. So, well, you you cutting, cutting your way to growth is I've, it's never worked for me. I'm not saying it hasn't worked for other people, but in my 40 years of experience with lots of companies, once you start cutting, and if you've got to keep cutting, the end scenario is not often very pretty. Right. Mark, along those lines, and uh, we talk to a lot of founders, like we love working with founders, and typically our sweet spots, five to 50 million of revenue. That's the world we live in. And we've gone over and we've gone uh, below, even so with some pre-revenue companies. And when you think about the future, whether it's three years or five years, the way I know you and I have talked about looking at the world, I often say, so where's your plan? Where's your strategic plan? And then I get a budget. And I'm like, okay, this is good. Budgets are good and budgets to work from, but a budget is not a plan. It's not a right. strategic plan. And sometimes that education process of why you want to go through those cycles, whether it's what should I do in AI? What should I do about my data strategy? How can I create more recurring revenue if that's the game that you're in? How do I build more customer loyalty? Oftentimes, you've got to take a step back and put some big ideas out there out of the normal day-to-day business and go strategize and, and, and work through those issues in some manner where you can reconcile your thoughts in a productive way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would also add on to that, Stephen, that I think you can't just do that exercise once. It needs to be a living, breathing part of your management process, right? Mm-hmm. Laying out a growth track is good. Looking at it at least quarterly, I was recommend and saying, okay, well, here are the initiatives that we talked about doing. Where are we on these? Are we finding that our assumptions are correct? Where do we need to course correct? What kind of return are we seeing on the early investments that we've made in these? It's a, it has to be a, a living, breathing, dynamic part of your management process in order to be effective. Absolutely. I concur. Yeah. You brought up the topic of AI. You just, a little bit ago here, and let's talk a little bit about how AI is, and particularly PE firms, I think in particular, seem to be very bullish on AI. But then as I've looked into AI adoption, and I've written a couple of articles around that, it seems to me that there, this is the height of Von Gartner's hype cycle. AI, I think, is probably at the peak of its hype right now. And 
and they're starting to see some, starting to read some things that are uh, more cautionary, let's say, in terms of adoption and use. What what are you finding in the organizations that you're talking to, Stephen, relative to PE firms, maybe even in particular? So there's a lot of articles and news out there. I, recently, I think it was Blackstone who hired the top AI person at Walmart to come in and look at AI strategies across their portfolio. And there is no single strategy today. And AI is a living, breathing element of the tech stack. And it's going to be here for a long time. So I think from the, the what the private equity folks are looking at is alignment with business outcomes and what is the learning path and the learning process and how can you apply some of those learnings across your portfolio, right? If we think about portfolio management, many of the larger firms, they've got an HR function that runs across their portfolio and provides support. Some do recruiting and talent and marketing support. And there seems to be a movement from because of the complexity and the nascence of the technology that some of the PE firms are now starting to put in that investment at the operating level where they can better apply that organizationally. Mm -hmm. On the smaller companies, it, it, it's a much bigger challenge. And part of that is how good is your data to start with? And if you're working in an environment where the quality of your data or the quality of your reporting is somewhat suspect, we've seen this movie before, Garbage In, Garbage Out. So really important that the health and wellness of the data is got, you're, you've got a good foundation from which to work from. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's something any organization can do today is start to build sort of policies and practice of data hygiene better, best practices, or maybe in some cases, better practices than what they've been doing. Because generative AI depends on your inputs, right? And Absolutely. So you're not going to get anything out the back end that's better than what you put in, right? And so those are some of the things I think businesses can do today. I don't think there's any, any reason not to try to get hands-on with AI, but I think it's probably a little premature to, to overdrive your headlights in terms of what you want to do and what your expectations are with AI. Because there's a lot around it, just in the basic evolution of the technology itself. And so if you, wherever you're starting with today, a year from now, you'll probably be dealing with a derivative of the or uh, next gen version, I think, perhaps. Uh, absolutely. And I think it all starts with what problem are you trying to solve? Have you identified an opportunity where you think applying an LLM, applying machine learning is part of a process? What is there a human in the loop? And how are you looking at that? Are you trying to use it for customer support? Or are you trying to use it to better enhance chatbots from the revenue side? I think a lot of people are going to focus there. There's lots of other opportunities, I think, within the business. And that's perhaps where people should look at, what other challenges do I have? Do I have a problem processing AP? Mm -hmm. Do I have some challenges with account management? Do I have other data-related issues where I could apply something in a small manner, contain it, and store tracking the relevance of the outcomes that it delivers? Mm -hmm. The the one thing I think about, Mark, is we've seen movements before, even in blockchain, which was the last big hype cycle we were in. The challenge, great idea of trusted transactions and all of these things that you could use blockchain for. But early on, it was technology in search of a solution. What problem? How are we going to apply th this technology? Hopefully the learnings from that, because that had a pretty big boom and bust cycle associated with it. Hopefully we're going to get 
I'm a little bit smarter Mm -hmm. because there'll be so many different use cases that are out there. And I would expect that we're going to start seeing companies start putting those use cases with what's worked before in libraries, more as starter kits, the software development kits, the SDKs of days old. I would expect we're going to start seeing some of that technology or solution orientation packaged up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and I I don't want to misstate your position on it, but I I think, Stephen, from the conversations you and I have had, we both love the transformational nature of technology. At least for me personally, I'm not technology for technology's sake, right? I've never been enamored by, oh, look at this, the new thing this thing can do. But I, I love the transformational nature of it where companies can figure out, how do I use this to differentiate my business? How do I use this to create new value? And start to think practically about both the needs and the opportunities where technology like artificial intelligence can actually play in, uh, a role in assisting the achievement of those kinds of goals. Listen, internally, Mark, I was somewhat skeptical early on because I've just seen so many hype cycles throughout my career. And I'm watching the way we're using it internally in some really in, very much research analysis, looking at and better developing a thesis with data validation by being able to work with this model. We have gotten better results um, with more validation in substantially less time that allows us to apply our time to do more for field testing. Whatever idea we've come up with, our field testing, our market checks on it are ultimately the ultimate check and validation. But we found that to be very helpful. And I've seen people who are incredibly gifted idea people, but their writing skills may not be the equivalent of their the way they ideate. Mm -hmm. And now being able to interact with this technology in a very different way that allows them to express themselves in a much more comprehensive manner in a way that they couldn't do before. And to me, that's fascinating. And and for some folks, very liberating. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, the dimensions of AI, which I find interesting, is the visual dimension, right? Because when you get when you do a typical Bing search or Google search or whatever, you don't get the, kind of the visual results that you, you get more typically, it seems, with AI these days. And maybe perhaps that's why there's so much investor interest in AI tools that uh, support visualization and image processing and things like that, because it's that it could actually be a differentiator from the sort of what we now consider the old form of search, right? Sure. Look, it, it, using a baseball analogy, I don't think we're out of the first inning yet. I, I think you're right. I think when we look back year by year, we'll see, oh, that was pretty primitive what we were doing <laughs> in, two th- in 2024. But it's interesting because some of the the industry CEOs say that about their own businesses. It's We won't have these products next year. We won't even recognize what we were doing in 2024. So that's a, perhaps a comment on how fast the industry believes the evolution of the technology will be. But in the end, you still got to do what's right for your business, right? So yeah, I don't. I, I think you. I think that's the harder part of it is figuring out among all the different platforms that are there. How are you going to bring some kind of control and governance and because I mean, AI like the like the internet and like mobile is, is leaking into companies through marketing and sales and product organizations even before the corporate IT people get their arms around it. Yes, and I think ethically responsible governance with AI is going to be on everybody's minds in the near future. And the one thing we've not grappled with from an LLM perspective which is 
if you're using other people's proprietary work, you can't use it for yourself. And I think we're still, as a society, we're going to have to deal with how that's going to shake out, right? Columns in the New York Times, Washington Post, or the journal and mashing them together and creating a composite that's not your, any original thought is not necessarily good for, for anyone. Right. Yeah. So you've suggested some use cases that people can, you, you recommend business leaders can start to explore. And you talked about research. I think customer services one that that's a fairly popular application for AI today. I wish I had it when I was running a service organization because I, I knew I would have been able to scale more profitably if I didn't need to bring in service operators on a linear basis with sure. the volume of the transactions or the number of customers we were supporting. Any other applications that you think about that you might say, okay, here's a good one. You can, I do appreciate your saying, well, look at your business processes, right? Figure out where your needs are there. Your, make your business cases first, right? identify all your business cases, and then perhaps you can prioritize, but the, the other part I'd add there, Mark, is what can you measure, right? Can you, whatever solution you're trying to implement and whatever use case you've got, hopefully there's a measurement attached to that. Am I impacting revenue? Am I impacting cost? Am I impacting margin? What are, am I impacting a churn rate? What am I trying to impact that I could measure the how well I'm doing, because that ultimately is going to be an indicator, because whatever you do, 1.0, is going to be an evolution where you're going to have to iterate. Mm -hmm. I think there also needs to be some leadership of cross-functional nature, like within organizations, because typically when you do something in one area, it does affect other parts of the organization. Mm -hmm. And we've both seen where that can go awry. Yeah, and I I believe in innovation. I've been a CIO as well as a, a chief marketing officer, and so I I'm always caught between we need a good architectural enterprise architectural standards right for the technologies that we're going to bring in and support and establish, and yet we can't let that stifle creative exploration of new technologies either, right? It's it's not an or. I think most businesses need to find a way to, to accommodate both, which is the harder challenge. Yeah. And Mark, at least I could tell you that in the past couple of months, we've been looking at a couple of deals and everybody's using the buzzword of AI in their marketing literature. But when you start peeling the onion back, it's a little less clear. Mm -hmm. And that suggests that everybody's thinking about it, but everybody doesn't necessarily know what path they're taking. And in some instances where people are using the term AI, it's a very loose interpretation of what artificial intelligence or machine learning is. But let's be clear, there's not gonna be a business that's untouched by this in some manner in the future. This might be the biggest transformational shift we've had in quite some time. When networking first became popular and we could connect all these computers and go beyond many mainframes and the advent of the internet, the advent of inter uh, interconnectivity, this is a pretty big deal. And it's gonna be with us for a while. So making sure your culture is also amenable and open-minded to that change in mm -hmm. some manner is also, I think, critically important. So organizations that have moved at a glacial speed, that might be great for the stakeholders and the shareholders, but this is not something when you start playing with it as you're evaluating the impact on your business, where you're gonna have the luxury to do that. So that alignment, I think, from a cultural perspective is rather important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when you think about your business's readiness to actually embrace 
AI tools and technology. You're going to get some technologies that are just going to come into the come into your shop because you're using this browser and now everybody's building AI in the browsers and you may not even have be conscious of how much AI is showing up internally because you didn't necessarily go out and make those conscious decisions to bring it in, but it is coming in as it's piggybacking with it on onto uh, existing applications. I thought I saw a Microsoft paper, which I thought was actually quite interesting because it took each of the Microsoft products, Excel and Word and PowerPoint, and it and talked about how would an AI enhance your use of those applications, which I thought was pretty interesting, right? Sort of building on applications that people are comfortable with and know, and perhaps that's a way of getting your hands dirty with AI without taking too much risk by just you know, using applications. I recommend to everybody, if you're not using some plugin on your email or on Word or Google Docs, you're missing out. I have a subscription to a product that I, I have Grammarly. It's worked well mm-hmm. for me. I know other that use other products, but it it helps you communicate better. And that's the whole point of why you write, right? Better communication, more effective communication. And if something can help you enhance that, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it, right? And I, th- I think between you and I would say, let's do it, but let's do it planfully, Let's think about what we're doing. Let's make sure we have a business case for why we're doing that. Thinking about culture in your own employees and how are they going to accept this? What are the implications to them is a big part of this that people are concentrating on the technology right now. And I I think maybe the bigger challenges are going to be those that are internal within your own workforce, right? Yes. Projections of how how many jobs are going to change or be eliminated. You're you're probably going to have some employees that are very enthusiastic and others that are very nervous about it. Yeah. Look, when we've gone through the changes, I've I've sold into the IT and technology departments for much of my career. And there is always one part of the organization that wants to play with the hottest, latest, newest tools. And there's another part of the organization that it's much more comfortable and is going to resist change because people generally don't like change. Right. I thought people did. Honestly, I didn't realize I was that much out of line with a lot of the way people behave. But I remember working on a a growth plan for a very large engineering company and they had they wanted to double in size in three or four years, and they don't they didn't know how they were going to do it or what their options really were, and so that was the essence of the challenge. But then when we got that part of the plan and the roadmap laid out, they're like, okay, now we're going to have to deal with the, the as you said the cultural parts of this, right? And knowing they they knew their employees much better than I did, and they're like, it's going to take us a year before people understand that growth can be a good thing. Because largely in a company like that, they didn't they had fairly consistent annual growth, but nothing that was going to raise anybody's eyebrows in terms of you grew that big year over year. So sure. I saw the recent numbers. I was listening to like one of Kara Swisher's podcasts and they were reporting out open AI's numbers that were released. And they, I think they tripled in revenue with deals, like partnership deals. They're over 3 billion yeah. in revenue for the quote unquote nonprofit. So there's a lot of activity out there. Yeah, there is. And I appreciate your coming on and chatting up on My some pleasure, of issues Mark. and opportunities, Stephen. Any sort of last words of guidance you'd like to pass on to the audience? Don't fall in love with what you're doing. Pick some metrics, fail fast, iterate, be comfortable that it's not going to be right the first, second, or third time, and just have the confidence to uh, persevere. Yeah. Great words of guidance. I, I hope you all take those to heart because they're, they're coming from somebody who's been through generations of new transformational technology adoption, right? And some of the guidance is pretty much, okay, this looks like that one, right? Let, 
some of us go back to the days when the Apple products were introduced and because of all the different fonts and sizes and whatever, all of a sudden, everything people wrote looked like a ransom note, right? Because everybody was playing with <laughs> aspects of the technology so it's pretty fun yeah so get your hands dirty with ai have a plan have a have an expectation for what you want to achieve evaluate the technology but spend some time thinking about your own business readiness what problems do you want it to solve and how are you going to position this within your employees i think those are all good takeaways as far as as far as we're concerned hey so Stephen, if People want to follow up with you. Um, how might they do that? If they've got questions, they'd like to direct with you through email. Uh, our web, yeah, our website www.orchid o r c h i d dot black b l a c k. And if somebody would like to reach out, just hit our info button, and uh, we'll get right back to you. Sounds like a deal. Thanks yeah. for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. No. So it's fun to jump on these things take some really hot topics and see if we can at least provide a little bit of guidance and caution. And as you said, so slow down a little bit, right? Yeah, you didn't miss the bus on AI. There'll be plenty of opportunities to do it well. And, and as the technology evolves, may even be even better than the opportunities that we have today. So uh, thank you. And hey, for all of you out there listening to the podcast, thank you all for joining us today. And if you got ideas for the podcast, you'd like to hear other topics you'd like to hear us discuss along the way, we'd love to hear them. So I'll sign off. Again, it's Mark Corona from Authentic and stay well, be well. Are you a business leader whose team is struggling with random acts of marketing? Are you an investor whose portfolio would benefit from a proven marketing operating system? Authentic is here to help. Learn more about our fractional CMO capabilities in our proven proprietary authentic growth methodology at AuthenticBrand.com.